one of my kids found this fancy magnetic storage media and uh, some of them they contained really nice stories that he really liked to listen to but then there were some others like this one here that didn't sound so nice it sounded more like it reminded me that i still have tapes from the 1980s that contain data so of course i was interested in figuring out how to read this information in this type um, one approach would be to try to find us a software that can do that another uh, approach uh, that I took was to basically look into what is the Modora tape format already searched for that before and then actually found some interesting information so now I had to process this a bit the, and then I will come back with a cut after this. It took a couple of minutes to read these documents on Wikipedia and another website that I found. But to summarize here, I figured out that we need to basically distinguish three different wavelengths out of the audio file. This is a short, medium and long pulse. They have given uh, durations depending on which system it is. All systems have the numbers written above and there is an NTSC version that has a bit shorter pulses. So basically what we need to do, we need to find, we need to try to figure out, distinguish these waveforms from a file. Let's see how far we get. I'm starting a new project in IntelliJ. Let's call that data set. Yeah, let's add that. Then I need an HTML file. Let's call that data set. HTML. Yep. And then I write the whole stuff in TypeScript. So that's about that. And then we need the digitized type. I'll just copy that into my project directory, then I can serve it from the same. Okay, it's still indexing, whatever. It will happen at some point. Yep. Oh, I don't need to add that one. Okay. Now we have two files that are completely empty and we have no clue what we want to do with them. Um, of course, first one is the HTML file that I'm going to load. Um, let's just start with something extremely simple and ugly. It's just a proof of concept after all. Tape decoder, just to put something in there that we know that uh, stuff is working when we are loading it. So that's uh, not a lot yet. And I should probably write that into the HTML file and not into my TypeScript file. That would make it so much less ugly in the syntax highlighting. And then I'm just going to uh, include the script that I'm going to use. And I'm calling that dataset.js. And I'm going to use a module type because that allows me then to use async in the main in the main file. So that's about that. Now we have a file that does not much more than just writing tape decoder. Let's see if we can surf that from my local server. I'm running some server written in Java that um, basically is just serving the files. Um, so I have that on the local host. And I have in some prefix devel misc data set then data set .html. And it's not running. I should first run that. Of course, that is a good idea to always have the, the server running first. It will take like five seconds until this thing is going to start. Maybe not. 
not yet. Maybe now? Still not. No. Now we have it. It's a safety code. And we have not many errors in here. So that's fine. Then now let's see. We want to decode this wave file. I could of course start decoding the tape file in the hex editor and try to figure out what how the wave file is stored, but I think we are going to cheat a bit. We're just using the HTML5 um, audio decoder functionality. So what we need to do is we need to load the file. I start with an async function because it's going to load from the server. For that load audio, I give it the URL. This is a string, and that will do some stuff on the end. So I need a response from my server, so I'm going to just await the fetch from this URL. That's about all that I need. So now we have loaded something, we got the response, and now we need to get the bytes out of this um, response. Um, we want it as an array buffer, but that is also again a promise, so we need to await for that again, so that it's not just returning a promise of a file buffer, of an array buffer. Then from these file bytes we want to convert them somehow to the amplitude values, the amplitude samples of the audio. I'm using an audio context from HTML5. Um, it's just a new audio context, and then we need to somehow decode the bytes. Let uh, audio buffer is again takes a while to decode, so we have to wait for it. Audio context dot decode audio data and the audio data we have just loaded from the server so these are in the file bytes so when we have that i think let's do some debugging to make sure that we're not doing something that doesn't work uh, audio buffer that has some stuff that is interesting like the sample rate that we can display Let's see if we get a reasonable sample, right? They have recorded this is 44,100. That's the CD quality. Let's see if we see this in the output. And there is nothing happening. What happens? Of course, there must be something wrong, as always. Did I disable the cache? Yes. But it's not trying. Oh, I need to call it over. Um, type wave we called it let's see if we call that and then get some result yes 44,100 that's exactly what we need good so far so good we have already decoded the data a bit now we need to get into the samples we need to get the samples um, const samples that we want to read this is basically the audio buffer dot get channel data and since it's just one channel mono that's just that and then let's dump a couple of samples there should be values between zero or is it minus one and plus one probably mostly zero in the beginning uh, let's not overdo it and just sample let's say 10 values and see what happens Yep, we get data, it's a float array, and the values are in the expected range. So we probably have real data here. So remove the debug output, and then we need to do something with that. Um, the best thing that we can do is probably visualize it somehow. Let me quickly write a visualizer for the data. 
Um, let's call that canvas. Very good name. Let's make it thousand wide and um, that's 350 or something, whatever. So we have just a canvas here now in the HTML. Now we need to visualize that stuff somehow. Um, let's add a function row buffer. We want definitely to have the data. That is a floats every two array. And we want an offset because we don't only want to always display the stuff from the start. Um, then we need to find the canvas. That would be the document that get element by ID. We call it canvas. Yay, we have a canvas. What can we do with it? Um, that context, we need the drawing context. Is the canvas dot get context. Oh, it doesn't know that the thing that we fetched is actually a uh, canvas. We just declare the type here. Then we can get the context. And we want a 2D context. We don't want to do anything fancy 3D. Okay, now we have the drawing context. First, what we do, we clear it, just for good measure. Clear the rectangle. Let's just clear everything. So now we have an empty canvas. And now let's define the middle of the height of the canvas. Because we have values between one uh, minus one and one, so we want to somehow paste them in the middle. Then we need to draw a line somehow, as quickly line hopefully. Um, begin pass for starting a line. Then four let i equals zero is smaller than inverse but width, and then i a bit more. Line to, I guess you should theoretically start it somewhere. And also, let's make a line to um, make it not too dense. We increase it a bit. Just make it i comma the middle that we decided times the the middle height of it. Multiplied by the data value at this position of set plus i. So as I mentioned just before, we need to somehow start the line. We cannot just continue the line. We need to somehow move to first, and that would be zero comma m. So we start at some point, and then in the end, never forget to stroke the line. Otherwise, we don't see anything. So now we would want to. Draw the buffer somehow. We need the data somehow. Okay, we need to re return the data here, and then we somehow get samples, and then we start that from zero, and then let's debug. What's wrong? Oh because this is an async function, we have to await for that. Okay, and now we can't await for that because IntelliJ doesn't uh, know that we are in a um, module, so we just export nothing. And then it knows that we are in a module, and now we can do that. Let's see if we get any results. Okay, we get the line, and it's slightly squiggly. That matches my expectations, which is nice. Okay, now that's a bit boring. We need to improve the visualizer slightly. We need to um, have some buttons. Let's make fancy buttons. That pull ID um, next. Make a next button and we somehow let's go like that. Cool. And then we need to somehow have a new value. 
let offset equals zero. That's a bit happy now, but whatever. So we add some at next button is next button is um, document of get element by id next and then next button dot on click that's a bit tacky too we could add it as an event but we don't need to do too much here because it's just a prototype um then we want to do something we want to take the offset and include increase the canvas width well we would normally need to in the production code we would need to uh, now read the actual size of the canvas but we just increase it by thousand because oh now it's this much then we draw buffer that again samples we still have because i made it global and the new offset yay let's see if that does something yep we have a button and it's moving nicely through our audio file too bad i cannot go back let's for good measures also implement the back button duplicate previous fancy arrow the other direction and then we need to just copy paste that stuff here It wouldn't even need an and need a button here we could just put in line that but let's not be too fancy and i don't check if it's above zero so it will just give undefined in JavaScript or formatting for guys and what happens something exploded okay that didn't work as expected um, what did I do? Oh, I added another handler that goes to the uh, different direction. I need to not copy that much. Copy paste mistake as always. Yay, now it is going back and forth. Cool, now we can debug stuff. Okay, seems like the function that loads the audio is working and our pro buffer function is nice. But let's now see, we, we need to figure out interesting points in the waves. Um, and that is, we need to find these starts of these waves. And just looking at the sign of the, of the data, at the current offset plus i. And if that one is not the same, then the sign plus i plus one then we have found an interesting crossing of the no uh, zero line um then let's just throw a little um rectangle then i don't need to change color or anything and we just throw it at the right position in the middle we make it maybe too wide that it can see something and maybe five high that is a bit bigger to see Let's see if we see something here. Now reloading. We should see some dots, yes. And nicely, we see that the dots are indicating where we have the zero passings of the audio wave. Nice. But now, since we need, since we know we need to get the the up and down um, version of the wave, we kind of need to slightly improve that. I guess we need to. Um, only care about the ones if the data at this initial offset was smaller than zero, smaller or equals than zero, and this one here. So, I'm probably missing a couple of races brackets here, like this. Let's see. formatting it a bit let's see now we should only see the highlighted is it working I 
kind of does. Weird. Um, oh, yeah, as always, that was the reason. Let's see if it not looks more like what I expect. Yes, now we get the point at the start of this nice up, down, up cycle. Okay, now we basically have figured out the interesting points. So that's enough for drawing, I think. That's working mostly. Now we need to identify the times between these intervals, I guess. Function samples to high, low intervals, something like that. Naming is always the hardest. Load array, and then I'm also passing the time period of sampling. Um, Sample interval, maybe it's a better name. I pass that as a number. So, because then I can say the last one is initially zero, that's when we start. That was my last virtual initial position. Then we have a current position where we currently are. Then we collect the intervals. That's a number array. Initialize it with empty. And then we go through all the elements. I is zero. It's smaller than data length. Um, be nice and do it minus one. It doesn't really matter, but let's do it a bit nicer um then current equals is the same as plus the sample interval and then we basically need this fancy function that we have here let's grab that from here and then we don't have an offset to justify it makes it easier we just remove all these offsets and if we have this fancy um, case that we just identified the right position, then we want to push a new interval because we have found one from the current minus the last. So that gives you the duration now of, of this little interval. And then not forget the last one that we found is the current now, so we will have the right stuff. And then we need to return that at some point, but first we probably need Closing trace more. Return intervals. Format a bit so that it's still read stuff. So now we initially draw it, we get the samples. So let's do something with the samples. Now we um, let intervals is um, sample is. Uh, this long number that I've, I've been invented here, we pass in the samples, that's the data, and then the sample interval, that is just the uh, inverse of the sampling frequency, which is not available here, so we need to somehow define that sample so we just invent that thing that doesn't exist yet, we, we define it just when we load it, it's a bit ugly, but for this prototype, just to find it as nothing until we have something. Then here we get the data from the audio buffer sample interval equals audio buffer dot sample rate and the inverse of that. And then I think I want this. Sampling interval sounds better. Okay, now we have the sampling interval. We throw, throw that in and then we have these intervals. Okay, but that's a bit hard to visualize. Now let's 
just print if that makes any sense. Um, so log intervals slice. We get a couple. We don't want all. And that is enough. It's probably even too much. Let's see if we get some fancy print out of fire of intervals. Oh, we get hundred numbers. They are very short. Oh, the sampling rate is a bit. It's obviously short. Let's let's define some um, once micros is one thousand is millis divided by thousand and um, millis is one divided by thousand. Okay, then we basically make this sampling. We basically map through this sampling rate. X is X time uh, divided by millis uh, micros. So we get that stuff in micro seconds then. And let's make it not too many decimals after the zero. Um, we do that. Need to convert it into a string. Boring two fixed with two digits. So let's see. Yep. That makes more sense. Now we have numbers in in the reasonable microsecond ranges. So this is maybe even already some data. It's very similar in length so that could already be some of the wanted stuff from the tape okay now we get intervals that seem to make sense nice and next now that we have the intervals we need to somehow classify the intervals okay um let's say classified is Classify is classify intervals. Um, yeah, I guess that's more or less it. Um, let's define this function. Want that a bit above. Let's move that up here. I don't think we need the samples now anymore. Let's get that stuff away to make it more reasonable or readable again. Okay, let's classify the stuff. Now, what do we need? We have, we need some constants. They need to be a bit more global. Let's put them up there. Let's call them const. We need to classify them into small. Let's call that one. Medium, let's call that two. And large is three. Doesn't matter. Um, so you have the constants. So, and then we also need to have this um, this timings const. Pal s. That's that's the duration of the thing in the pal system. That should be two six four point four. Wait, right. three six four point four. times micros, something like that. Um, and then we have the medium and the large, and these numbers we just steal from this slide again, 531.4, 531.4, and 6, and 7.6. So that will we need some kind of tolerances and whatever at some point. And I guess in the real real solution, we would probably have to synchronize the synchronizing um, waves in the tape that I'm completely ignoring for now because I only run for the bits because I want to see if we can get anything seen from this tape. Okay, let's see the um, the stuff. We need to somehow classify the stuff into into something. Let Again, a number array. 
it define as empty, then we define a range on the small range, this range. Let's say that's 100 microseconds. 100 microseconds, that's very low, but we need to have some kind of a range for finding where, it can, where the stuff can fit in. And then we basically take the pal, the middle between the pal small and the pal medium, maybe. I have no clue if that will work from the beginning. But let's say that is our first interval for the small range. And we need the medium range of microseconds that we want to get the large range. So then the medium one starts obviously where the um the previous one stopped and then the, the upper range is between the medium and the large somehow and the medium and the large the large ones they start between medium and large and then it goes up to whatever 800 micros or whatever 900 or shouldn't matter that much we need to just classify the stuff somehow. Then, um, in range, we need a function for that, otherwise, I need to call that. I need to write the same code too many times. It's also not really efficient now. Uh, So that gives us if something is in the range. It's really simple, of course. Um, let's say return. I cannot speak and type at the same time. Um, let's say if the value is equals is bigger. Right, I think, and um, if it's larger or equal or smaller, I would say smaller than range one, something like that. Then we need to go through all the samples of the of intervals. I call it have called it samples, then it would be, uh, would be nicer. If in range, um, the short range, this, uh, the sample is in the range of the short range, then have simple, we just uh, classify the push uh, short. Yay. And if that's uppercase, in range, medium range, sample, then we push medium, I guess so, in range, large range, sample, we return and then we add a large, yeah, and in the end we return the classified. Okay, we said that this could be called samples to look nicer. Okay. But it's intervals actually. Yeah. Uh, okay, it should be actually the other way around. That should be an interval. Okay. Whatever. So now we have the intervals. We have them classified. Now let's debug that a bit. Console.log classified classified slides couple let's say we take 10 and whatever and let's see if it explodes. There we have three one 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 okay that is some stuff it's in the expected range it didn't explode 
let's see nice then after we have classified it now we need to figure out what is a byte so let's decode it.com decode it is decode classified let's define that as a function have it here and then we have an array of classified numbers so we need to convert them into bytes that's our current task so we need to go through all of them and we need to find the ones that are the start of a byte marker for now in the productionized version we would need to figure out where is the uh, synchronizing then we will probably have to reclassify with the synchronized data and then we would decode it we will probably interleave the decoding with the classification in the real world solution but we are not doing real world we're just we're just doing some kind of a hack at this point um we just want to figure out how we get a bit so we need to have a pointer of where we are in our huge buffer that would of course never be possible in a real Commodore because we could not even store the first 100 milliseconds of samples in the RAM there that would be too much for this small computer but we have a million times more RAM in the browser and about a million times more CPU time so we can be a bit ugly let's go until we have no more and then we need to find if the classified at this position let's go nicely one less so we can easily ask classified i is this is a large we have that here we need to figure out where is a byte start we said it's large and then a medium so we need to have a large here and classified i plus one needs to be a medium if we have that then we are at the start of the byte if we're not at the start of the byte then we just increase i not to forget otherwise you're already in an endless loop and then my browser will crash they do that these days so then if we have found this start of a byte then we need to skip the two by the two classifications that we just read now we need to read a byte somehow and the byte is having the least significant byte first i think if i remember the documentation correctly we had that somewhere here least significant byte so byte marker least significant byte and we need eight bytes and the parity okay there we go we need to read a byte that byte is zero in the beginning we have nothing else to say that parity it's a one parity so let's start it with one and then just xor all the bits then if it's equal the parity bit it should be the same so or uh, we need to read eight bits and the parity so for e i does zero it's more than eight. Oh, that's not a good idea because i already have an i let's take another i Let's take a J. Let's take J. And then J plus plus. So we magically read a bit, I have no clue. And then we add that to the byte. And we need to shift the to j times the bit that we just read so we add either a zero or a one shifted by the right number of 
it's parity equals parity x or where is that character on my wrong keyboard or the bit okay and then if parity equals the next get bit then we were successful and we're happy and put that into the result push the byte so then we have to pie it else so we have a parrot here let's play the parrot here we begin with zero okay now it's almost done we just need to figure out how to read a byte a bit that's also not that hard because we just have to distinguish between two cases and we return that as a number so we read the classifier that position i i that's the right i again and then we i plus plus because we consumed it then we classify i again because we consumed it so then if a equals here we have short, long, and medium as it got short, and B equals medium, then we should have found the zero. Then we return zero. We don't need an else because whatever, we are already out. If A equals medium and B equals short then return a one everything else is an error return a zero whatever we should maybe not return anything because we are in on the bad parts but maybe we just I mean that's another question for production I think the now of course I called it get bit in one case and read bit in the other case get bit so now we get the bits okay that's about it now what do we do we need to return the result okay we are done now we just um console log decoded and then what do we do just go through all of them we need to map the stuff that's filtered the stuff filtered if we get the bit that is greater than greater or equal 32 that would be the space character and x is smaller than 128 let's say like this then we get more or less a reasonable ASCII range and then if we see characters then I declare it a success and we can have a chance to make something more fancy out of it. Maybe it will just explode. So string dot in character code, so more or less. Okay, let's see. Okay, nothing happened. What happened? Three one one is that my result? Okay, that's that's weird. No, that cannot be my result. What happened? Oh, here is my result. Oh, that is actually more interesting. What? Oh, I have another. I have all people of output here. So, okay, let's just join them into a string. It's nothing. And then if we read any text that looks, looks like a comment or like a variable name or type name, then it's already quite good. Hey! okay okay there is some stuff but i cannot really say if that is now actually readable code or if that is is it just garbage hmm that's a good question now so we have definitely something that comes out but it's not as clear-cut as i hoped i was hoping for actually 
more ASCII text that would be more like readable. Um, hmm, okay, what could be wrong? Something is definitely wrong. Now the debugging session starts. So the bit is actually reading, increasing the right counters. That is good. Short, medium, medium, short, long, medium. That looks all good. We classify not so greatly. Maybe the classification sucks. That is very well possible that we, that it basically sucks. Um, mm -hmm. That's a good question. Now, what could be wrong? Now, we probably would need to add a histogram to see what is in the data. That could be just that this uh, this tape is not perfectly aligned or anything could go wrong. I could have made a mistake somewhere, which is likely because now we're in the debugging session. Uh, short, medium, medium, short. So that is probably right unless, unless I took some wrong notes somewhere. So let's look at uh, what we did here. I guess we need to cut that part out of the video at some point to make it a bit shorter. The range function seems to be okay. The numbers look reasonable. Okay, what could it be? <laughs> Milliseconds are right. The buffer is okay. The samplings looked okay. Guess the biggest issue probably is having having bad ranges of the of these numbers here. I mean, we are maybe too picky about some stuff. Does that do any change? No, that doesn't any change. That would be change. would be weird anyways, yes. Mm. I guess the only hope is to basically figure out what's the what is going on in the data we need to somehow create a histogram of of what actually um what data we actually see in the in the waves so it can be that the tape is slightly slower slightly faster so let's see what we can do let's go some step back and look at the intervals we need to make a histogram out of the intervals. From zero to 800 micros. The sampling interval is our bucket size. Then we need to, we need to just define this function somehow. Cannot be that hard. Um, let's call it label. Um, what should we do? We do have a histogram on the on all the data. Hmm, then we basically subtract the number which we know is zero let's call that min for that max 
and it raises the bucket. And then we need to go through all the data. Um, it's a new array, not an arrow, an array. Um, with of number type. And the size is mass floor max minus min, which is zero, though it could be just max for this simple thing, but uh, divided by intervals times um, a plus one, obviously. Uh, of course, that. That's good. Um, uh, now divide the bucket size. Oops. Okay, now we have an interval. We fill it with zero so that we don't have undefined but number in there. And then we go. We go through all the data. If the sample is smaller than min, then whatever. If the sample is bigger than max, then whatever. And otherwise. Um, Mass floor implements min divided by bucket size. Let's call that to not confuse myself. And then histogram from bucket number plus plus. Turn the histogram. Something like that. We don't need to basically ask that to be in line if I have the right. Yes, if the right. It's easier. And then we have the histogram. We need to dump it. Histogram. Okay. We need to. Map that into um, x comma index, and then we give make a string out of index times sampling interval, and then we add. The number that we found at this interval. So let's see if we get that. Uh, maybe the number should be fixed because otherwise it's a bit ugly. Oh, that one is is an integer. It doesn't need to be ugly. That one is ugly. So let's see what happens. Okay, now we have a uh, histogram, and we see the. Peak as expected, there is a peak, and there's another peak, and there is no other peak. Okay, so this is probably the there is something wrong with index and sample interval. Why, why don't we get an index? Doesn't map give index and sampling interval is defined. That's weird. Oh. No. Index has something into there is a deep there's a problem here with something into the Let's see. Now the sampling interval makes sense. Oh, okay. The sampling interval we need to divide that stuff a bit by micros. 
because otherwise it's a bit not human readable and if I round it to two as the most then it's very much not readable. Okay, now it makes much more sense. So we have the first peak with 272. What did you expect? Boy, well, that's way lower than that. There's something wrong. Maybe the type is bad or I'm bad. Let's make that 272. That's weird, but let's see. Then there is another spike at 408. And then the rest goes up. Let's see what happens. Cannot go more than wrong. Hey, that looks way better now. Okay. That looks like a code that could, I could have written on lighting. Was probably on lighting. Links, left, shift, fire. Oh, that, that's, a, that's a game. Okay, that must be one of some games that I wrote a long time ago. That's cool. Oh, but maybe that's actually... There's some Commodore... Copyright in there, 1980-something, just about off. Okay, so the whole exercise was actually quite successful. We just learned that I can either I made a significant mistake somewhere of converting the, the interval sizes or the type uh, is completely off. More or less, that's kind of success. We are reading definitely numbers that are ASCII numbers, so they are not just made up numbers that are, that are in the bytes, they are really ASCII numbers, so that is mostly good. And we didn't do any synchronization. Well, I did now some synchronization by, by looking at this makeshift histogram. So we found something there's definitely room for a lot of improvement. We need to basically better capture the, these bumps. We need to better split the um, the values across the tape. So one problem could be that the tape has been written many times. There are multiple programs on this tape. So maybe at some point it's faster, at some point it's slower. Maybe it's summer, winter, different tape drive. So it, that can stretch these histograms, of course, and the, the separation is not very clear. So we probably need to actually look at the synchronization markers that have been added by, um, by Commodore and uh, in the format so that we can actually make sense of that. But that's basically then step two or step three. And another thing that needs to be done, the format description, it, um, it repeats the same 192 byte blocks twice so we can basically correct errors so we will probably have to remember which bytes we, uh, we were not sure about whether parity was wrong or there, uh, there was some kind of other error and once we have that we would um we would have to take the one with uh, the second copy where it, where it went better hopefully and then there is also a one byte checksum on the whole data block. So we would also have to use these and then maybe tune the parameters and try again if that still doesn't work. But yeah, okay. We basically succeeded quickly writing some kind of a wave analyzer. Figuring out the wavelengths, that's probably still the um, initial synchronization pattern that I completely ignored. I should have looked at that, but that's way more complicated than this was just a proof of concept if we can actually read some data. I guess that's good enough. We are still within one hour. Yay. Barely made it in one hour. That's good. And if I add, if I cut out some debugging stuff, then it will be better. Okay. And this.